Thank you all. Um, and Russ is an absolute delight to work with, and I'm appreciative of all the Clinton School has done to uh, bring him uh, to us. And Russ, I'm going to work on your bonus when I get back to the office, too, <laughs> for that great introduction there. Um, sorry, y'all. I, I try to stop my, so I don't bore y'all forever, but trying to, okay, here we go. Oh, no, that's not it either. Wait a minute, one more second. Here we go, here we go. It's going to start, oh, there we go, okay. Because, um, you know, they gave me 15 minutes for this. So I want to make sure to stay on time. So thank you all so much, and thank you for being so generous with your time uh, this afternoon. So as I read the conference theme, Elevate Children, um, we often talk about or, or think about um, prioritizing the needs of vulnerable children as the core of community philanthropy. Uh, it seems to infer investing our time, talent, and treasure in developing programs for children. Um, and uh, um, uh, saving kids or, or doing things for kids. Now, let me be clear. That's absolutely right. Developing programs is absolutely right. Developing ways in which we work with our vulnerable kids is absolutely correct. But I want to disrupt that a little bit. And Trish started that, and Derek um, and Brandon, when they did their panel. I want to disrupt that a little, little just a little teeny bit. How we use our time, talent, and treasure to, of course, serve and work on behalf of kids. But how about we use our time, talent, and treasure to teach them how to do that for themselves? When we think about elevating children, oftentimes, again, even the image here, again, I am not criticizing, OK? Because some things get confused. Y'all leave here, talk about how I criticize children's programs and <laughs> criticize the little poster, right? I want to be clear, as clear as I can be. This is in addition to. There is no competition. There's no either or. We got to do all of this. We got to do it all. All of it. So, but I'm going to speak on a particular aspect. We talked a lot about programming. Now, I want to talk about how we work with elevating young people as ambassadors, advocates, and activists here in Arkansas. Now, when you use those words, those words don't come to mind when you talk about young people, does it? A young person as an activist, the first thing we think of, especially those of us who are older, are the hippie days and afros and sunshine and big glasses and protesting, right? But then those protests actually led to change, didn't it? When we think of young people as ambassadors, you say, now my 14-year-old can't even put together a sentence, much less go out and be an ambassador for Arkansas. But yet, even in who he or she is, if he can't put together a sentence, that's a problem in and of itself that they can't be an effective ambassador. So working as ambassadors, and then advocates. There's lots going on with our education system, with our healthcare system, with the like. We need young people raising and elevating their voices, but not us doing it on their behalf, using our time, talent, and treasure to teach them to do it for themselves. Now again, that seems scary. Even as I talk about this, I've given a talk like this once before, and then it got back to me in, in, in interesting ways about how I shouldn't talk like this to people. OK? I'm being honest. You know, you shouldn't. Should the president of the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation talk about kids taking it to the streets or, or being a part of the change and, and doing this and doing that? Oh my god. Yeah. OK? And I'm like, well, you know, we did talk about social justice. Well, that's not social justice. I'm like, OK, hold on. Stop. Hold up. If we want change and we want justice, what justice movement has ever been nicey-nicey? What change was pleasant? What change didn't come about with some aggression, aggressor, someone confronting you about something? We never want to be, feel that discomfort. We never want to feel it, but yet we want things to change. Similar to what Trish said earlier, I am sick and tired of Arkansas being 48th and 49th in the country with, in, in college and in college education and, and degree completion. If you ask me, there should be some young person right now saying, why am I being remediated? And not just me, but why is a whole bunch of the rest of us being remediated? We need to demand that system to work differently for us. Right now, we have an Expect More that Reagan and Russ leads our Expect More effort at the foundation. 70% of the jobs in our state, 70% currently of the jobs in our state require a high school diploma or less. 
require more credentials. The future, as we all know in this room, will require some credential. Why don't you have young people who are educated on all of that and then say to us, who are in positions of philanthropy, state government, business and the like, to demand better, to flip that 70-30. If you don't say something, we're going to be 70-30, 10, 15, 20 years from now, then their kids are going to be in that same spot. Y'all, that's not right. There ain't nothing right about that. And then we're told there's no urgency. There's no urgency there. You know, kids today, we, we, we view them as being apathetic. Um, what is it, the millennials? Russ, what would I, what I say about y'all at the work sometime? <laughs> you know, wanting too much and, you know, when, and, and I'm like, it, 70, 30, we can't, we can't, how, why are we continuing to be 70, 30? In some of our districts in our state, individual school districts, up to 50% or more of those kids can't read on grade level. Cannot read on grade level. And again, I say to myself, why isn't, one, that should be against the law. Like, you're just jacking up your schools if you got folk who can't read on grade level by third grade and 60% of them can't read. Like, you just, you just bad. You know, and I know teachers and everybody going to yell at me. You can yell at me all day, every day. If you're telling me that folk can't read on grade level and you've been in that classroom for 10 years and for 10 years your kids can't read on grade level, that's not good. It should be against the law. Against the law. And young people should be taking it to the streets, wanting more from their communities. Taking it to the streets here in Arkansas, in various places, demanding a better education system taking it to the streets saying, we demand better jobs. We demand that you prepare us for better jobs. We want a better future for our state. So we have to raise up folks to be those advocates. Now we've seen many movements across this country where young people were actors, key players in a change process. We've seen it most recently with undocumented students. Those are mainly young people who are working on and speaking about immigrant rights. We've seen it most recently um, transnationally in the LGBTQ uh, movement, that that was a lot of young people that led those movements. And if you want to go old school, you know, uh, uh, Diane Nash and, and John Lewis and Stokely Carmichael and all them, they were barely 18, 17, 16 years old when they did those movements of old. So there is a strong history in our country, but children ought to be seen and not heard in the South. But being seen and not heard means that we continue to perpetuate the changes that we're just not seeing. We, we need to see that change. So in, in, I just want us to think about this much differently, that we can use our time, talent, and treasure to actually raise up some activists in our state. Young people have the desire and capacity to change the world and to change Arkansas. But how are we using our time, talent, and treasure to make that happen? Now, it is happening in some areas. We have several grantees. I think of um, the Arkansas United Co um, uh, Community Coalition, AUCC, that was started by young people, still run by young people. And again, their goal, their mission, is for those who are uh, documented and undocumented immigrants to know their rights, to know, um, uh, uh, to, to, to be able to integrate well into Arkansas. Um, but to do that in a way that is about building community, not in isolation, but about building community. They also have as the key to their work uh, the DREAM Act. And some of us know about wanting to charge in-state tuition for those who are in our state because they too are Arkansans. And so they've been working on those issues. Um, and we've been a supporter of their work in that uh, building that capacity. The Interfaith Worker Justice System is another one. Uh, Inter Interfaith Worker Justice Center is another one, started by young people, uh, run by young people. And again, their mission, their passion is to ensure that workers in our state are treated fairly, that they know their rights and they're able to fight for their rights. Um, and so, again, run by young people. So there are examples in our state, and I can name a few others. So I don't want to say that there aren't examples in our state. But the point is, is that I would like to fund 20, not just three. 
or a few. There should be more. In the work that we do at the foundation, I uh, talk with the team. Uh, most recently, we were having a conversation again about um, in-state tuition and charging in-state tuition. And we were thinking about various audiences that we need to reach in, in that message when our study is done. And one of the audiences that we said we needed to reach is young people. Because I'm sorry, old heads is getting on my nerves. <laughs> old heads, we're talking about it and we're doing what we can. I'm, you know, I'm not dissing nobody. We're doing what we can. But the young people, we need that passion, we need that energy, we need that innovation and technology that they use. We need them, they are struggling with these issues themselves. These are their friends who aren't able to go to college and get a good education and build their families too. We need another voice in this, and we need to build and harness that voice for this, for this challenge. In the work that we're doing on grade level reading, again, talking to the team and saying to the team, you know, let's engage young people, because they were just out of elementary school themselves. How about we engage them in this conversation, not just as tutors, which we need to do. Young people being tutors to young people, I'm in full support of that. But if young people actually knew that 60% of their friends, family members, neighbors didn't read on grade level, you can't tell me someone wouldn't bubble up and say something about it. If the adults aren't saying something about it, maybe the young people can say something about it. And not just say something, but actually equip them to do something. So as agents of social change is important, as advocates, um, young people, as advocates, they, they're, they're, you, you know, they can speak truth to power to their peers in ways that we old heads, and I'm 50, I know I look 25, but I'm 50, uh, in ways in which their peers can hear it. You know, because we're just, you know, we just blah, 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 like on Charlie Brown with the wonky, wonky, wonky. But if you get some young people who really think and, and, and talk about these things, again, there are examples of this. In New York, the young people, when they were about to raise that bus fare, oh, they took it to the streets. And the fares didn't change. Uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that we see going on right now. In uh, Los Angeles, um, uh, again, work around immigrant rights, uh, young people doing all of that. There are real live current examples. I was in Cuba last year, and one of the things that uh, they said about not having the internet was because if we get the internet, then they may do what they did in Egypt. Or they may do what they did in China. So this fear of even empowering young people with technology, a way to communicate, to advocate, to speak, to, to get together on these issues, there's such a fear of it that you have some countries that are trying to shut it down altogether. Well, this is the United States of America. It's a freedom, it's a right. Like, we got a right to take it to the streets. You've got a right to organize ourselves around some particular issues, figure out a good strategy, take that strategy, and pursue a change process. Much of the change processes that young people have done was not funded by big, big foundations. It was funded through community philanthropy. So being able to equip young people, not just equip, but enable young people, youth, to speak truth to power in ways that their peers can hear it and to develop their concepts, to develop that call to action, to mobilize themselves, to speak up, to identify those systems of oppression, to work with their peers, to make change in their community. Let's build those advocates. And then the last one is building those ambassadors. You know, young people operate in formal channels, informal channels. Um, and they do, they do participate in the political process, even if they're silent. Silence is actually participation because it's a choice. Silence also is deadly. And building our ambassadors, building young people so that they actually are connecting to a movement. Now, again, we have programmed our young people, but have we actually encouraged a movement? Have we actually enabled young people to understand that they can organize, speak, strategize and raise money, build a network, and address a change. Like if you really think about your own work, if you really think about your own community, when was the last time something like that even happened? 
Now, to be that type of ambassador and to talk and speak and, and speak on these issues, um, it's not easy. It's hard, but it needs to be done. Increasingly, young people, especially our immigrant youth, are connecting in social movements in parts of the world. They're being inspired through social media and television. Um, they're getting involved and engaged in, in politics. And what they're doing also, when I see them organize, and I think about the Occupy movement in particular, they attempt to organize according to the principles they would like to see enacted in the broader world. So we don't have to do this old school like we did, you know, I speak to young people every now and again, and they talk about the civil rights, and all they think about is a march. But they're not even understanding that before you march, they're like 12 steps before you march. Marching is actually because you had done all these other 11 steps, and you need a visible, a visible demonstration that you mean business. So you march to let people know visibly that this isn't just me, but I have five, six, a million other people behind me. But well before you march, there's a whole set of negotiations. There's a whole set of approaches that you take. There are lots of avenues and channels. So I know that, but do our young people know that? Are we actually teaching that to our young people? Are we saying that to our young people? So when I say be disruptive and to use community philanthropy for young people to be activists, to be advocates, and to be ambassadors, it is not for the sake of just, you know, getting in the streets and we all being afraid of them, because that's a lot of what you conjure up. It is because Arkansas needs to change. We need to change. Whether we want to admit it or not, we need to change. Change is not nicey-nicey. If we're going to get from being 49th in the nation and not having college graduates, then that means we got to do something radically different. And radically different doesn't mean dummying down college. For us to be world competitive and not market our state as we are a low-wage state, hey, come here. That's crazy. That's like taking low self-esteem to a whole nother level. And we need young people to speak up. We need young people to say, hey, look, policymaker, this is unacceptable. Here's what you need to do. We need young people in their communities to say, hey, look, our schools aren't performing well. They're doing our, 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 our residents, our students a disservice. Here's what you need to do. And half of y'all need to go. And when you need to go, here's how we're going to replace you. Uh, Lejeune talked about how in Baltimore, uh, there was a, the Young Alliance of something, I forgot, I wrote it down, I don't remember it now. But they wanted to build a mega um, jail for young people, for uh, offenders who could be, um, who were convicted of, they were young people who were tried as adults. And there was a facility that was going to be built just for them. And young people said, absolutely not. And not only did they say absolutely not and it wasn't built, but then they gave them some alternatives on what you could do with these young people. We can do that here. I'm from Baltimore. They're just as bright as we are. I mean, you know, it's, there's nothing magic, but it requires courage. It requires will. It requires being supported by adults. And it requires a commitment to change. And when you have that change, and this is the last thing I'll say as we build our ambassadors, advocates, and, advoc and, and activists, let's make sure that we don't tear down their dreams. Because I'm sure that when those young people went out there, they had somebody who was so fearful for their lives. That's real. I'm sure when they went out there and said they were going to do that, someone said, you're not going to get a job. That's real. I'm sure when they went out there, someone said, that'll never happen. You're trying to go up against the system, it won't happen. Okay, that's real. But like David said to Samuel, don't put your stuff on me. Don't put your stuff on me. He said, I'm going to slay that giant, and I got a new way to slay that giant. Let me tell you how my new way to slay the giant is going to be. And my new way is with social media. And my new way is talking to one another. And my new way, there's some new ways out there. Don't let us not put on young people our stuff. It's wrong. 
Because what happens? 10 years from now, I'll be giving a speech mad as hell because we're in the same spot because we didn't build, through community philanthropy, the activists, the advocates, and the ambassadors that we need to make the changes that we need in Arkansas. So please, let us think about how we build that for our young people. Again, I got nothing against programs for young people. They need after school and tutors like everybody else do. I got nothing against systems change because that's what we do at the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation. I'm, in full, I'm all for systems change. But that's our role, right? That's our role. Now, the community's role is to make sure that we build the voices of young people so that the changes we need to make in our state occur. Because I know y'all as tired as I am in being 48, 49, 50th on whatever statistic they got, we seem to be down there. So with that, I say thank you. Keep in mind, activists, come on y'all, activists, activists, advocates, advocates ambassadors, ambassadors for our young people. Let's teach them, let's grow them, let's protect them, let's honor them, let's encourage them, but let's make that happen because it's not doing on behalf of them, but making sure they have voice in their destiny. Thank you. Then. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciated that you said it's both and, you know, that there are those programs on the ground that are needed. And here's a question that I have for you. I think so often when we're on the ground working with people in poverty, young people in poverty, we're hearing their um, concerns, but we don't always know what to say to them to empower them. So I want to say that because we're not all set up as advocacy systems, mm -hmm. you know. So I will give you two examples right now. I've literally had um, three different parents, young parents, who talk about having no power. These three different parents all had their children taken away from them mm -hmm. through foster care. Mm -hmm. And what each of those parents separately said to me was, I just want my kids to be together. In all three of those systems, in all three of those families, the system is failing them, a system that says that children are supposed to be kept together. That's not happening. What can we, the question is, what can we who are on the ground having those conversations do to equip and empower someone who has so little power when we're not set up as an advocacy training organization, if mm -hmm. that makes sense? Yeah, and oftentimes, if you're not set up that way, don't do it. Do what you do best. Um, and if you have core competencies, and clearly you have excellence, uh, our house is a WF grantee, just want to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, you have excellence and, uh, and have grown that organization and the like, do, do you, like do it best. And I, I get this question a, a couple of, every now and again from grantees. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we do not have a good infrastructure for this type of training here in our state because it has not been valued. And it hasn't been valued, and that goes back to issues of, of structure and power and racism and et cetera, which I won't give a history lesson, but there's a reason that it doesn't. Um, and as a result, we do all feel that we don't have power, or if we do, there's retaliation. Um, I remember speaking about this in a Delta town, Patricia, you know, I remember speaking about this and someone said, Dr. West, if we do what you say, we won't work, we don't have no jobs because all these people employ us because of the power structure, the power dynamic. <clears throat> and so that's real. Again, it's real. And um, so for you, I would say, is there either nationally, because if we have to go outside of Arkansas, we may have to. Is there nationally or is there some group or organization locally who can take that challenge and, um, and work with you in it? In other words, don't change your programming and what your core competencies are. But how do we partner and collaborate in ways in which we can build their voice and, uh, and build a movement there? Because um, that's important. It's important if our system is set up in such a way that destroys families instead of keeps them together and try to build them, then we need to change that system. And, um, and we need those strategies. So that's what I would say is that in community, getting back to what I mentioned to Patricia just now, it is about figuring out, if, if there's, people often ask me, what is the one thing you've learned working here and in Louisiana and the other? And that is that we really cannot do any of this in isolation. Mm -hmm. You really do, this is, Trish said this earlier, you really do have to get the courage to go across the street and talk to that person who you believe is against you or who is different um, or who's been negative before, you really do, you cannot do any of this in isolation because it is about building voice. 
and it is about making change. And if you get across the street and you find that they're still an idiot, then you didn't, you got a target and you keep it moving, right? Because <laughs> either way, however they feel about it, the change needs to occur and you just have to forge ahead. And again, this is not easy. I mean, I've done this work. I have been ridiculed. I have been embarrassed. I have been in the paper. I have been talked about behind my back. I have gotten nasty emails. I know that this is not easy. I know it. And, um, and I know the, what it takes to make that change and to step out there. And I've been told you're going to fail. <clears throat> and I've been told, how dare you say or believe such and such. So it's not easy. But, but if you don't take the risk, then we still will be 49. Yeah. If you don't do it, then we still won't be able to read. Um, and we still will have schools that, that have a 60% or more uh, uh, poor reading proficiency rate. So for me, it is we're, we're, we're going along to not disrupt and to be polite or I don't know what, why we're doing it. But, we're pers but poverty is persisting because we're allowing it to persist. And we're allowing it by not pushing for change that need to be made to make our state better. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about NGOs in developing countries. I come from Malawi and we're usually at the receiving end of developmental aid and most of the times the aid comes in the form of representing a voice for the voiceless but as you've presented the children are not really voiceless it's just that they are not provided the platform for them to voice out their concerns and coming from a developing country we are usually like I said on the developing end so for someone like me who is working in the nonprofit sector what advice do you have for me to actually navigate through those complex systems that are set for us to say this is what you should do for the children this is what you should do for technology policy change and this is what you should do for um, girl empowerment so what advice do you have for someone like me who is working in that sector how can we navigate through such complex systems thank you so in most organizing, it really starts with talking with whom it is you want to work with. And that's really the first step. And once you know who you want to work with and you truly listen to what it is that they're saying, then you can develop your, your platform and your strategies. That's really the way to start. Um, really, I mean, it's, and you may say, that ain't, uh, that's too simple. <laughs> but once you start talking to people, it's actually not that simple because then you have to synthesize what you're hearing um, uh, because people will give you their different, mm -hmm. it, you know, it comes in so many ways or forms. And then, but you really, there probably is some commonality there. And you have to assess who's willing to do what, what talent you have, um, how much this really means to someone. Third world and developing countries, they're the ones where young people speak up the most and you know we've seen this time and time again. I've seen we've seen on TV and in movements where they're even willing to get shot for some of their stuff. And um, you know we got Americans who would you know would give you up for a ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you know where your heart, your 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 passion. I mean, again, just talk with folks. Learn what it is that they are willing and want to do because you may be a one-man show and nobody really has that level of passion. Complaining is not social change. Um, and I think, who was it, Derek, that talked about service. You know, unless you're actually serving and willing to step out there for what change you want to make, you're just whining, you know, just fussing. So you really have to talk to people to really know what they want to change, who they are, what, what this is all about. Um, and then you kind of move from there. The other one too, I mean, anger and, and frustration is also ways in which people organize too. That's more spontaneous than thoughtful. There's nothing wrong with either. Um, and I would say to you, really equip yourself on, on pedagogies of change and pick, pick one. And uh, so, you know, we saw that with Dr. King, who's probably the one we all know, uh, but there are other examples where, um, you know, hit that the whole, the nonviolence is a pedagogy. It's actually a, 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 a school of thought. It's a process. And he embodied that. 
Um, and he mirrored that and lived that. And so for you as a leader, I would say you need to explore what change processes you want to pursue and become that change process. That was a great talk. You're always very um, inspiring. Um, my question is about um, mindset change. So, you know, I think it would be great if we could train up these ambassadors and advocates, but we don't, but we, you can't force anybody into Correct. it. And in the Delta, we have this generational poverty that we're combating every day. Um, ha have you run across any studies that, you know, kind of encourage that mindset change to really empower people to do it, you know, on their own or, or you know, but what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the mindset change, that's the one that's the hardest. That's the one because you get folk who feel so, so, so hopeless. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when you have that, fortunate or unfortunately, that's where you need a charismatic leader mm -hmm. or a set of charismatic leaders. And, um, and you have to develop that charismatic leader. In other words, that's a model or approach. Some things you like, anyway, I won't, sorry. <laughs> but a charismatic leader is one such. Um, that's why I explained to you, you need to study the various types of approaches. Um, but changing that mindset, it, it's tough. And when you do your strategies, that's why you have to have low, what they call low-hanging fruit or quick wins or early wins, because you also have to make sure you give hope along the way. And um, anyway, there's a whole process or, or, or approach to it that you would need to take to change your mindset. But often mindsets are also changed when there's urgency, and we saw this in Ferguson. Um, Ferguson had been a community in that state for many, for many years. They had an urgency, and that urgency has actually sparked this change process that's going on there um, with them building their own capital and, and political capital and social capital and, you know, uh, in, in terms of the people. Now, physically it may still be the same, but it won't be the same in five to ten years. Um, but they were awakened by what became a very negative incident, unfortunately. There may be some sets of data or something that you can create that urgency around that can then spark uh, that change in mindset. Again, starting with children and youth. Oftentimes, people do, everybody wants their kid to read and read well. Um, everyone wants their young people to do well. So there may be some urgency in your community that you can elevate. And in elevating that, you can also work with um, changing mindsets. The mindset gets changed. When I've worked with residents of public housing and uh, assisted housing, which is where I started my career, the mindset oftentimes gets changed when they actually have something to feed into, a movement or something to feed into. And oftentimes in the Delta, it's maybe too sporadic or not consistent enough to really feed into it and, and, and uh, be a part of it. So. I don't have an answer per se, more so than ways or strategies or, or ways to think about it, but one way to think about that is creating that urgency. Thank you so much for your comments. So we often talk about passing the torch and making sure that we have a new generation of leaders, but oftentimes um, young leaders like myself were, were met with resistance from the seasoned um, professionals or seasoned um, leaders in our community. So can you talk about ways that we overcome those issues and um, we continue to disrupt and be activists for the things that we believe in? We ain't passing nothing. What I'm saying is create a torch. Go get you a new torch. Ain't no torch, ain't no tor torch, no. <laughs> Knock them out the way, just be like, you know, sit down. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, I will say more about that, but I'm done. <laughs> no, actually I will. So in Batesville, <laughs> we were in Batesville recently, I'm gonna lift up Batesville for a moment, and uh, they're doing a community change process in Batesville. When we've been there, Pretty much most of those who are leading that process, I know are under 40. Again, I'm 50, so everybody is young to me who ain't 50 and above. Um, but probably even under 35. Now, of course, there are some struggles, and they talk to us about those struggles. But, but they like, no, we got a Batesville. Mm -mm, nope, nope, there's a new Batesville. And there's a whole new group that's leading Batesville, and it's us. And they want nothing passed. It, they didn't even take a torch. They just created their own. 
So that would be my advice. Y'all, we ain't passing nothing. Don't ask nobody to pass a thing to you. Create your own, get you a new torch. Let's give Dr. West Scandal Bay a round of applause. Thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. Thank you dear.